My healthy habits. Surprise is the only We're emotion an that requires an interpretation. Oh, wherever we go. But the real choice we, go we can change this is what life can do. Thank you. I have a riddle for you. What is strong enough to move boulders, yet light and airy enough to dance in the wind? What has the slicing power to cut through stone, yet the agility to climb to the tallest of our Douglas fir trees? What can surround us like a blanket to keep us warm, yet turn on us in a moment and freeze us to death? Sounds magical, doesn't it? It is. It is water. That amazing substance that covers 70% of our planet and is in the air all around us. It's such a simple little molecule. It just looks like Mickey Mouse, doesn't it? <laughs> Oxygen, two hydrogen atoms. But don't let its simplicity and commonplace fool you. For its complexity and its behavior has been the curiosity of science for centuries, including myself. So what do we know about water? Well, we know that when it's bouncing around up in the air, it's quite an introvert. But when it forms a liquid, ah, that's when it becomes the extrovert grabbing madly onto other nearby water molecules, being very gregarious, in a way that we as scientists call a hydrogen bond. But non-scientists might say that water knows how to pull off one heck of a rave. <laughs> Imagine a dance party where everyone's dancing with three or four partners at once and constantly swapping them. Whoa, yes, that's water, and it is not monogamous when it's in its aqueous phase. In fact, its gregarious nature is what gives it its most special properties, such as it can absorb a tremendous amount of heat and its temperature not change. In fact, because your body is 60% water, that's what keeps your body temperature at 98.6 Fahrenheit, 37 centigrade. Even while you have millions of chemical reactions going on at any particular point or have a hot bowl of chili. So it's also this gregarious nature, though, that we as scientists have hard to describe theoretically, and that's a big challenge today. So equally difficult to understand, if not more so, is the surface of water. So have any of you seen a bug or a leaf float on water? Right? Yeah, it's pretty commonplace. Have you ever wondered why it can do that? It just seems that somehow, those water molecules at the top in that top layer are different than what's down underneath them. And that difference is what I've spent the last 20 years with my students trying to understand. And so you might ask why, with all the possibilities of things to study in the world, why choose that? Well, a couple of reasons. One of which is I'm passionate about environmental issues, and water is a key element of that and we are in Oregon. And secondly, because I'm a laser geek, I admit it, since I built my first laser when I was 23 year old, years old in graduate school, I've been building and working with them ever since for a number of decades. And my students work along with me. So if you were to go into my laboratory at the University of Oregon, you would see many tables, big tables, of big laser systems. And then you would see a lot of little optics that my graduate students are carefully aligning perfectly to get those laser beams to bounce back and forth and get to the surface of water in a beaker. What you won't see, though, <laughs> is the number of the laser beams because they're invisible to the eye, which makes it a little difficult for my students to actually align everything perfectly. But when they do, and that light bounces off the surface of water, it tells us a lot about how water bonds to its neighbors and interacts and behaves. And when it doesn't, when the experiments don't work, well, we boil water and we have the most expensive teacup in our laboratory. <laughs> we try not to do that. So why is it so important to understand the surface of water? Well, think about it. Everything that is in your water, whether it come from a pipe, or from the air, or from the soils, it must get through the surface of water. 
And that's why it's so important. And that's why we're interested in studying it. And we do know some things about it, but some things we don't know quite so well. What we do know takes us back to that rave I talked about. You're looking at your glass of water. What's going on? And there's the big party, the party going on where the water molecules inside the liquid or inside the water just grabbing each other. But as those water molecules then get closer to the air as they go to the surface, they actually find they have less dance partners, so they get kind of stressed out. And we actually call that surface tension. That's a scientific term for stressing out. But that surface tension is created by something changing with those water molecules when they're at the surface. So if I'm water and this is, I'm oxygen and these are my hydrogens uh, out here, you know, when the water is in the bulk of your glass, it's just going around in all different directions. But when it gets to the surface of water, it becomes somewhat constricted in how it orients. And in fact, at the surface of water, it actually is like this, parallel to the surface, kind of bobbing along, kind of bobbing along. However, some of those water molecules do this. They actually have one hydrogen going up into the air and one going into the water. It's just hanging out here looking for a dance partner. There are no, none out there because air is a really lousy dance partner. <laughs> and so that different behavior at the surface is, in many respects, what help gives it its special properties. And now that takes us to how we use that kind of information to do the next stage of our studies. And that is to be able to understand environmental issues. So, in particular, we're very interested in understanding what happens up in the air in atmospheric chemistry. And a lot of the chemistry that goes on in our, in our atmosphere happens within clouds. Those clouds are made of little water droplets, little aerosols, little particulates, and there's a lot of chemistry that goes on on the surface of those and also inside those droplets. We used to think that most of the chemistry up in the, cloud, in the atmosphere is just stuff bouncing off each other. But now we know that inside that little water droplet up in the air, that aerosol droplet, is almost like a little chemical factory. And once things can get in, like gases are constantly bombarding those droplets, once they get in, they can be converted to something that could be even safer or worse. But the entry point is, again, getting into that water surface. And so that's why it's so important for us to understand that if we're trying to understand atmospheric chemistry. Now, the molecule of choice that we have selected for these kinds of studies is something called sulfur dioxide. And this looks, again, kind of Mickey Mouse-ish, like water, but it's very different than water. It's very pungent. It's very toxic. And where does it come from? Well, it comes from volcanoes, came out of Mount St. Helen, came out of the Kilauea volcano. So it has natural ways in which it gets up into the atmosphere, but it also has man-made waves that it gets up in the atmosphere. And that is that it comes from burning dirty coal, coal that has sulfur in it. And when that sulfur, that coal is burned, it creates sulfur dioxide, which then goes up into the atmosphere. And if it makes it into one of those little droplets up there in the clouds, it turns into sulfuric acid, which is very corrosive and also very toxic. And when those droplets, when those droplets get together and coalesce into raindrops, they come down in what's called acid rain, and they acidify lakes and creeks, killing fish and plants. So it's not a good thing to have happen. But understanding acid rain requires an understanding of that simple first step of whether it gets into the uh, water surface. And so what we've been doing with our experiments is then to figure out what we thought were three options, what might be happening once that sulfur dioxide gets towards the water surface. One, could it possibly be just bouncing off? Doesn't even want to go in. Two, is it possible that it just dives into that surface? Doesn't even know that the surface is there. Or third, we thought kind of a wild possibility that maybe that that water, because it's kind of lonesome out there with this guy hanging out here, that maybe it's going to kind of grab on and find SO2 and, like a temptress, pull it inside its lair. So with our experiments and computational work, we figured out the answer. But I'm not going to tell you the answer. 
you're going to have to figure it out. So here we go. So this is a picture of the theoretical simulations that we did. And what you're going to see here is sulfur dioxide and water is indicated. And you got a lot of little white fuzzy stuff back there. That's water. But I've highlighted a few of those water molecules at the surface so you could see what happens as that sulfur dioxide comes down. So let's take a look. Oh my gosh, look at those flirtatious little beasts <laughs> going up and grabbing that SO2 and pulling it in. And in fact, this was the one of the first studies that had been done that actually demonstrated something like this. First of all, one of the first studies that have been done the way we do them to look at a pollutant at a water surface, but yet alone to show how water could be such a phenomenal temperess for this uh, sulfur dioxide. And again, why this is important, these kind of results are important because of the big picture in understanding pollution requires us, and even climate change, requires us to use large theoretical models. And inside that model is a lot of data, important data. And this is the kind of data that's needed to go into those models to be able to predict what's going to happen for climate change and also weather issues. So the second example I'm going to give you takes us down to Earth. And this is quite a bit different, but it's still related to the surface of water. And that is what happens when oil spreads on water. Now, we've all witnessed the horrific environmental impact of an oil spill. It's horrible. And we don't have a good way to clean it up. In fact, one of the best ways to clean it up, or the one that's used these days most, is to actually have a plane fly over and put chemicals on top of the oil to break the oil spill up into tiny little oil droplets dispersed in water that then microbes can chew up, or they'll just be dispersed by waves out into the ocean. However, those chemicals called dispersants that are added oftentimes are extraordinarily toxic. In fact, in almost all cases. It's a mixture of a cocktail of chemicals. And so the holy grail in cleaning up an oil spill is to find dispersants that can be put on an oil spill, that can change that oil into tiny droplets, but those chemicals are ecologically safe and biodiversible. And that's what we're working on in our laboratory. But to get there, we have to back all the way up and understand what happens when oil is next to water, because even that has not been well understood until some of our experiments. And so, if you have heard of this before, that oil and water might hate each other, yeah? And in fact, we have a term for it, that oil has a phobia, it's hydrophobic, uh, meaning that it hates water. If you look in the literature, water doesn't feel so happy about oil either. In fact, there are textbooks that say that when oil gets next to water, it balls up in itself and doesn't want to play with the oil at all. And then there's a theory set of theories that say once oil comes next to water, that actually there's a vacuum layer between them with nothing there, and that they never actually touch each other. <laughs> never have to touch each other. You sometimes like to do it that with your siblings. Uh -uh, I mean your children, I should have said. <laughs> My wonderful children. Um, so, but the point is that our experiments then went to look at that water molecule that straddled the interface, at the air-water interface. And then we put oil on that interface, and we found out that this guy was still there. This water was still oriented this way. But it actually was grabbing onto the oil. He was actually dancing a bit with the oil, just a weak dance, a weak handshake, but certainly not the vacuum layer, and certainly there to interact with the oil. What that means is that interface is very different than what people had expected before. And other studies have then uh, backed that up, too. That this junction, now that we understand better, can pull a lot of different chemicals and dispersants in it in ways we might not have imagined before. And so our studies today are now to take different biodegradable surfactants or dispersants, put them with, mix them with oil, see how easily they form these little droplets of oil in water and then study how these different chemicals assemble to gain information about how we might make safer dispersants for something like an oil spill. 
You know, oftentimes we're so busy that we take for granted this amazing thing that's called water. Forgetting the fact that none of us would be here, there would be nothing living on this planet if we didn't have water. So the hope is, as we all learn more about water, we all will do more to sustain it, protect it, and to cherish it. <laughs> to cherish it when it falls from the sky in the winter as snowflakes in beautiful patterns. To cherish it when it rises from the soils in the spring and summer to nourish our plants and those needles on the top of the Douglas fir trees. And to celebrate when the rains here in October come in Oregon, when it fills our creeks and our rivers, so our salmon can make it up to their home spawning grounds and make the next generation. It is up to all of us to protect the water in our home so that we too, on this earth, will have future generations with water. I thank you.